Kenjaku was one of the most devious masterminds Jujutsu Kaisen has ever seen. Having come all the way from the Heian era, he's changed bodies several times over the last 1000 years. This is a huge part of how he learned so much about Jujutsu and gained many of the abilities he has today, all of which played a huge role in his plan to take over the planet. Kenjaku has done many depraved things and earned himself the title of the most evil sorcerer in history. Kenjaku landed in the Meiji period after hundreds of years of changing bodies and found a woman who could get pregnant with a cursed spirit and forced her to have nine pregnancies and nine abortions. This is how he made the death paintings, including Choso, whose lives he's been orchestrating since the very beginning, making him an evil mastermind, a master manipulator, and one of the most vile people to ever live. One of Kenjaku's first big feats happens before he has a single fight in the series. Kenjaku was having a meeting with Jogo, who represents the disaster curses, who asked Kenjaku for his help in defeating the sorcerers. Jogo and the disaster curses are all special grade cursed spirits, making them some of the strongest curses in the series. So them having all their strength combined and still needing to ask Kenjaku for help is very telling. One of the disaster curses is Hanami, who attacks the Tokyo and Kyoto students during the exchange event. Hanami not only walked through Maki, Inumaki, Noritoshi, and Megami, but also took five black flashes from Yuji and a playful cloud strike from Toto all in the same day. Inumaki and Noritoshi are semi-grade 1 sorcerers, which puts them close to special grade curses and strength and Yuji is equal to Toto in the exchange event, a grade 1 sorcerer who should be on par with special grade curses to some degree. Even with the Black Flash being a 2.5 exponent for Yuji, that takes him to 120% of his potential and Playful Cloud boosting its strength based on the strength of its user, Hanami is still strong enough to survive and keep fighting all of them with no break in between. In the Shibuya event, Dagen faces off against Naoito, Nanami, and Maki, who are Supreme Grade 1, Grade 1, and Grade 2 in strength respectively at the time. Nanami attacks Dagen with his 7-3 curse technique that creates a weak point on his opponent's body, which does no visible damage, on top of almost one-shotting Maki Zenin before he's interrupted. Dagen is able to pressure the three of them until he's forced to open his domain and had a chance of killing all of them by himself, even with the help of Megami if not for Toji's intervention. In the end, Dagen is finally killed with the combined effort of four sorcerers between Grade 2 and Grade 1, and someone who was able to push Gojo to his limit in the past. Jogo, the curse speaking with Kenjaku, then shows up to face the same group after Dagen is exercised, to which Nanami and Naobito say he's on a different level than Dagen altogether. Jogo blitzes Nanami and Maki, taking them out of the fight with a single attack each, and then kills an injured Naobito with one move. Jogo is also said by Dagon to be in the same league of speed as a healthier Nabito, who moves so fast with his curse technique that grade 1 sorcerer Kento Nanami can't even see him move. Jogo having brought down three sorcerers either in the range of or approaching the range of special grade curses, then takes his lead. The leader of the disaster curses is a special grade curse spirit named Mahito, a curse who can manipulate the souls of others. Mahito doesn't take any serious damage from anyone that can't damage his soul, and can even bypass his opponent's defense to target their souls directly, which hardly anyone can defend against without knowing about the soul themselves. Mahito barely understood his own abilities against Kento Nanami and still gets thought of as someone that needs to be exercised immediately before he grows to a point of no return. Mahito is generally accepted as having more potential than all the disaster curses individually in their own words, and is one of the most dangerous curses that was seen during his time. Yet even with all of this on their side, the disaster curses still see the need to ask Kenjaku to help them and even listen to his orders as the series goes on. When meeting with Jogo, Kenjaku goes over what he and the disaster curses will need to do for wiping out the sorcerers to succeed. Kenjaku tells Jogo that sealing or incapacitating Gojo and making an ally of Sukuna is the only way for this plan to work, implying that Kenjaku places both Gojo and Sukuna above himself since he doesn't even bother with saying that defeating them is an option. Kenjaku and Jogo's meeting then ends, and the plan to seal Satoru Gojo begins. In the plan to seal Gojo and fully revive Sukuna, Kenjaku and the Disaster Curses want to hunt down Sukuna's fingers. Jujutsu High has six of Sukuna's fingers in a storeroom hidden inside of 1,000 doors that change locations on a regular basis. Kenjaku gets around this by planting one of Sukuna's fingers inside of someone's home and making a talisman on it using Mahito's cursed energy. This leads to Mahito easily tracking down the finger and stealing every one of Sukuna's fingers and the death paintings from Jujutsu High. The plan to invade the Kyoto 
exchange event doesn't stop there, as Gojo still needs to be dealt with so they don't all get killed. Kenjaku's plan is to keep Gojo locked out of a barrier that has Hanami, Hagemo, and Juzo Kamaya inside. When he's questioned on if doing the opposite would be better, he notes that locking Gojo out will keep Gojo's focus off of Mahito's mission, showing that Kenjaku's ability to plan out missions is beyond the disaster curses and why they all listen to what he has to say. While they're still planning, Gojo and Sukuna become a topic of discussion. Hanami asks Kenjaku if killing the students is off the table, and Kenjaku says he doesn't recommend it since there's a landmine for Sukuna among the students of Jujutsu High calling Sukuna a bomb against both themselves and Jujutsu High that shouldn't be set off until it's needed the most, showing that even when Sukuna is only at 15% of his strength, Kenjaku's respect for what Sukuna can do has not been diminished. Later on, Kenjaku starts his plan to seal Gojo on October 31st in Shibuya. Gojo is attacked by both Jogo and Hanami at the same time. They both have domain amplification, which can nullify curse techniques on contact. Gojo notes that them knowing about domain amplification makes sense considering they're working with a curse user. This implies that Kenjaku knows domain amplification, as Gojo believes that he taught it to Jogo and Hanami himself. Kenjaku's plans to nerf Gojo didn't stop there as he went much farther with making sure Gojo couldn't use the full extent of his abilities. Gojo was fighting Jogo and Hanami and Choso in an area surrounded by civilians, which Kenjaku set up due to Gojo being at his strongest when he's alone, because anyone around him will be killed or get in his way. This is one of the many benefits of Kenjaku having the memories of Suguru Geto, Gojo's best friend, giving him detailed knowledge on Gojo's strengths and weaknesses, and many other events in the series. Kenjaku's plan succeeds and Gojo was stopped from using red, blue, or hollow purple to wipe out Jogo, Choso, and Hanami. Kenjaku finally puts the nail in the coffin to seal Satoru Gojo and gets him exactly where he wants him. After being forced to use his domain expansion to wipe out 1,000 transfigured humans, Kenjaku places Prison Realm next to Gojo's body. He then appears in front of Gojo and his dead best friend's body to flood three years worth of memories into Gojo's mind, meeting the one minute requirement of time passing in someone's head for them to be sealed. Kenjaku then succeeds at trapping Gojo inside of Prison Realm and seals away the strongest sorcerer his generation had ever seen. After sealing Gojo, Kenjaku moves forward with his plans and the disaster curses aim to wipe out the rest of the sorcerers in Shibuya. Kenjaku is then approached by Nanako and Mimiko, who he made an agreement with to give Suguru's body back after his mission was complete. Kenjaku then mocks Nanako and Mimiko for not using a binding vow and basically laughs and sends them on their way, basically getting the two of them to work for him for free and keeping Suguru's body for himself. After a long fight between Mahito, Yuji, Toto, and Nobara, Kenjaku walks in on Mahito being hunted down by Yuji. Yuji then charges after Kenjaku wanting to get Gojo out of prison realm and immediately falls to the ground. Kenjaku explains that this is from one of the cursed spirits that he tamed, which he then piles on with many other cursed spirits to overwhelm Yuji even more, showing that he can pretty much overwhelm Yuji at any point in time with little effort. Mahito still being alive has unfinished business with Kenjaku, as the two never fully trusted each other to begin with. Mahito then lunges at Kenjaku, which Kenjaku dodges, barely even acknowledging Mahito's presence. This is an attempt by Mahito to attack Kenjaku with idol transfiguration to change his soul, to either kill him or turn him into a transfigured human. Kenjaku not only dodges Mahito, but targets Mahito with cursed spirit manipulation, and Mahito is then absorbed. Back to Kenjaku and Yuji, Kenjaku explains Uzumaki, cursed spirit manipulation's maximum technique. Kenjaku describes it as an attack that combines all of his cursed spirits into one and hits his opponent with super condensed curse energy. Kenjaku also points out that the potential of Uzumaki goes even further when curses of semi grade one and above are used and their techniques are extracted. This is something that Suguru has has never done, and shows that Kenjaku has even more knowledge on how to bring out the technique's true potential. The Tokyo and Kyoto squads arrive, and the fight between Kenjaku and the students of Japan begins. The students try to attack Kenjaku with arrows, guns, and Miwa's new shadow style. None of it works against Kenjaku, who crushes Miwa's sword with his bare hands. He also wasn't touched a single time by any of the students, despite Noritoshi being close to a special grade curse in strength, and having arrows that can track their targets, showing how far the Kyoto students stand beneath him even when all of them combine their best abilities. Choso then shows up in a rage against Kenjaku as he finally figured out that he manipulated him into fighting his own brother, Itadori Yuji. 
Choso is a special grade death painting and is at a level where he's categorized as being one of the strongest curses in the series despite him being half human being. He's also able to push Yuji to near death despite Yuji being said by Toto himself to have surpassed him. Yet Choso dealt with Yuji even when he was taken to a place that made it hard to use his own abilities. Going straight after Kenjaku, Choso uses flowing red scale and claps his hands to get ready. Using piercing blood, Choso fires at Kenjaku, who dodges casually, something that Uroume couldn't do. This attack is said by Yuji to be so fast that even at long range, his odds of dodging were 50-50. Yet Kenjaku had no issue moving out of the way, even at a shorter distance than what Yuji struggled with. Seeing Kenjaku dodge his piercing blood, Choso doesn't stop his assault on Kenjaku. Choso rushes Kenjaku to attack him hand to hand, and Kenjaku doesn't take any damage a single time, and even mocks Choso, saying he must be tired and should relax. The same Choso who could swap hands with Yuji, someone who could wipe out the entire Tokyo and Kyoto squads by himself in the Kyoto Exchange. Urume then freezes Choso and several of the Tokyo and Kyoto students, and the fight between Choso and Kenjaku reaches its end. Once all the students are frozen, Yuki Sakumo makes her entrance, and a conversation between the two begins. Kenjaku clarifies that his goal is to create chaos that not even he can control. This is the reason that he went on a 1000 year mission to capture Tengen, to create a cursed spirit out of 100 million people's cursed energy, putting his entire journey into perspective as he wants to create something that's beyond him. Himself. Having used Uzumaki against Miwa, Kenjaku has already extracted Mihito's curse technique for himself. He then uses Idol Transfiguration on many people in Japan at the same time, by casting the technique remotely on people he already had marked. Kenjaku explains that he changed the brains of his targets to awaken vessels and rewire their brains for sorcery. The latter being something that Mihito, the original owner of the technique, has only done with one person at a time, let alone many people in different colonies like Kenjaku does, showing that even when using a curse technique technique for the first time, his knowledge lets him use Idol Transfiguration even better than Mahito does. After Kenjaku starts the culling games, Yuki, Maki, and the others need to find Master Tengen to figure out how to unseal Gojo and what to do. Tengen then reveals to them that Kenjaku was the one who set up the murder of Riko Amanai at the hands of Toji 11 years ago, the mission that sent Tengen's evolution spiraling out of control after the merger didn't go through, adding one more thing to the list of events that Kenjaku orchestrated over the years. Tengen also shares that this isn't the first time Kenjaku came after her over the last 1,000 years. Kenjaku has come to stop Tengen's merger two times before, fought two separate six size users, and lost. Even after killing a six size user when they were still an infant on the day of the merger, the six size still appeared. This gives even more of a reason why instead of aiming to defeat Gojo, he chose to seal Gojo, since two users of the six size can't exist at the same time. Over the years, Kenjaku's actions have brought him one step closer to throwing throwing Tengen's evolution out of control. Now that Tengen has become more of a cursed spirit than a human, this makes her a target for cursed spirit manipulation, and she can be absorbed instantly. Tengen being more of a curse now also lets her merge with anyone, and if he wants to do so, Kenjaku can merge Tengen with the entire planet, flooding malice into all of humanity at the same time all of which play into Kenjaku's plan to create a cursed spirit out of 100 million people's cursed energy. As the series progresses, it's shown that several strong fighters have been brought back from the past for the culling games. These players had their souls preserved by Kenjaku to let them cheat death and come back hundreds of years later in prime condition, something that none of them knew how to do on their own, showing that even without being able to change bodies, Kenjaku was aware of ways to cheat death using his own means. One of Yuji's friends from high school is then shown sleeping, and Kenjaku walks inside of her dream like nothing is even happening. Kenjaku states that the space between a dream and reality is a curse, and speaks to the girl on his own terms. This shows that Kenjaku may have this curse under his control, and may be able to invade the dreams of others at will. This gives him a very unique option for interacting with others that has not been shown by anyone else so far. Later on, Kenjaku is shown to have taken over the Kamo family and basically exiled Noritoshi as becoming the heir to the Kamo family altogether. It's then shown by Kenjaku that he used one of the curses under his control to rewind a man's brain 150 years into the past. The man is shown not even recognizing those around him, and doesn't even recognize that those who were long dead are no longer around showing that Kenjaku can take someone's mind so far back into the past that they don't even remember who he even is. 
Kenjaku makes progress with the Cullen games, and stopping him from absorbing Tengen becomes a primary objective. Yuki, Choso, and Tengen plan on how they're going to counter Kenjaku, and Choso plans on facing him alone to start the fight. Choso is then told he'll die if he faces Kenjaku alone more than one time, which neither Choso or Tengen refute. Even with him having strength equal to that of a special grade cursed spirit, Choso is no match for Kenjaku in any capacity even in his own eyes. Kenjaku breaks into Tengen's barrier and the fight between Choso and Kenjaku begins. After firing off a piercing blood against Kenjaku, Choso has a small piece of a supernova next to Kenjaku, which he detonates and Kenjaku blocks using a single cursed spirit. This is the same attack that had Yuji reeling in pain, although this one is on a smaller scale. Kenjaku then shrugs off the entire experience and keeps moving. Even with Choso wanting to kill Kenjaku, or at the very least, die getting him to expand his domain, Kenjaku is completely unimpressed, telling Choso that he and the other death paintings are disappointments and failed experiments when it comes to seeing what mixing a human and a cursed spirit can do. Kenjaku also proves that he's above Choso physically and mentally by showing him that he already understands Choso's plans before they were even completed. This further reinforces that there was no way for Choso to beat Kenjaku one on one, and without Yuki Sakumo, he would have died with no contest. After mocking Choso for being so much weaker than him, Kenjaku floors him by attacking him with low grade cursed spirits. Kenjaku then confirms that as a special grade sorcerer, he has the ability to wipe out an entire country. This is mainly due to cursed spirit manipulation, which lets him summon an army of thousands of cursed spirits at once to wipe out anything in his way, leaving Choso no choice but to listen in agony as he couldn't even touch Kenjaku a single time. After being taken to his limit, Choso brings himself back into the fight by thinking about his brothers cheering him on. Choso uses different moves like imitating Aso's Wing King, some of Kachizu's abilities, and even tries to punch Kenjaku like Yuji. Not only is none of this effective, Choso's poison blood that he took down Naoya and Uraume with wouldn't even affect Kenjaku to begin with since they're related, erasing one of Choso's most effective tools in Kenjaku's presence. Kenjaku finishes mocking Choso for not having any moves that are effective against him, and Choso once again stands to attack. Choso brings out his curse technique, which Kenjaku avoids which Kenjaku calls him out on, but this isn't the point of the attack. Choso then uses Supernova, which is now surrounding Kenjaku, who uses a gravity-based curse technique to send Supernova crashing to the ground. Getting rid of one of Choso's strongest abilities and showing a new curse technique from Kenjaku for the first time. Yuki Tsukumo then breaks through Tengen's barrier and enters the fight, and is now Kenjaku's main opponent. Yuki Tsukumo is a special grade sorcerer and one of the strongest on the planet when she's introduced. She's one of the four special grades alive at the time and can wipe out an entire nation on her own by Kenjaku's own definition. As a special grade sorcerer, she's also someone who can easily wipe out special grade curses with no issue, and is one of the most dangerous opponents that Kenjaku can face. Kenjaku notes that he didn't find any information on Yuki's technique, and summons a special grade cursed spirit in response. The curse is an Asian god that uses concepts against curse techniques, and is known for removing obstacles from its path. The god is a Hindu god, Ganesha, which is known for cutting down and removing obstacles, capturing and binding negativity, and having the power to steer individuals on the right path and overcome inner weaknesses and vices, while also having the power to ensure success or create obstructions for those whose ambitions have become destructive. Although Ganesha is destroyed by taking a shot from Yuki's Garuda to the head, which is one of the most effective ways to exercise cursed spirits. Yuki then tells Kenjaku that her curse technique lets her imbue virtual mass into her body, and punches him so hard that she rips straight through both of his arms in the process. Kenjaku then heals himself with reverse curse technique, which is evident by the smoke around him, showing that not only can he regenerate limbs, but he won't be killed by anything that doesn't destroy his brain in a single attack, making him hard to kill for many in the series, even if they did land attacks against him. Yugi starts thinking about Tengen's plan, and Kenjaku picks up on her hesitation, calling her out for not using her domain as he expands his own. Kenjaku's domain expansion, Wound Profusion, then rips apart Yuki's simple domain and crashes down on her, sending her falling to the ground. Kenjaku was praised on two occasions by Tengen, one of the best barrier users in history, as being on par with Tengen and even having a domain that's amazing by her own standards, showing that not only is Kenjaku one of the best barrier users in the series, but can also use the same open domain expansion Sukuna uses from Shibuya that's thought of as divine compared to others. Kenjaku notices that Yuki is heavily injured, but hasn't taken down her Shikigami, 
and the fight between the two of them resumes. Yuki eventually lands a clean hit to the head against Kenjaku using her Bombaye, but Kenjaku ultimately survives. This is spoken about by Kenjaku himself as Yuki being weakened from taking so much damage from his domain expansion that she had yet to recover from, with Kenjaku then fighting both Yuki and Choso at the same time. Seeing that Yuki is struggling to use her full strength, Choso buys Yuki time to recover with reverse curse technique. Yuki then uses this opportunity to heal herself and tags Kenjaku with a punch to the face, the same kind of punches that ripped through both of his arms at the same time. Yuki notes that Kenjaku's curse energy has been chipped away by using reverse curse technique, which she also used moments before, making it highly likely that the only reason Kenjaku survived in the first place is due to Yuki's cursed energy being lower than it was before. Yuki and Choso then go straight after Kenjaku at the same time, with more malice than ever before. After dodging their attacks, Kenjaku brings out his gravity technique a second time to pin Choso and Garuda to the ground and neither of them reach him. Yuki then notes that Kenjaku's gravity technique lasts 6 seconds with a 2-3 meter effective range around his body showing that he can't always spam it and needs to cover the gaps using Cursed Spirit manipulation. Yuki then rushes in to face Kenjaku and engages him hand to hand. Kenjaku responds by firing off a mini Uzumaki to damage her upper body and rip through her stomach with two separate attacks. Uzumaki is an attack that condenses the power of Cursed Spirits into a single shot, which Kenjaku then condensed even further to make a miniature version that he could fire from his hand, showing a mastery over maximum techniques that no one else in the series has shown so far. Yuki then grabs Kenjaku by the leg after having her body ripped in half and starts flooding her body with mass to create a black hole. Black holes are strong enough to suck in light, with Yuki's black hole being strong enough to drag in the entire planet on its own. Kenjaku then reveals that his gravity technique is really anti-gravity, which he's been using the reversal of this entire time, and stops Yuki's black hole from ripping him apart before he can be sucked in by its gravitational force, letting him nullify something that could have destroyed the entire planet and trapped light itself by acting quickly enough to save his own life. Later Later on, Yuji and the others get Angel to open Prison Realm with Jacob's Ladder, and Satsuru Gojo is unsealed. Gojo immediately goes after Kenjaku with no hesitation, and Kenjaku is saved by Sukuna, who's at 15 fingers. Kenjaku then tells Uraume that he would have died to Gojo immediately had Sukuna not been around and Kenjaku is once again confirmed to be below Gojo and Sukuna with no real room to say otherwise. A lot of people question why Kenjaku does what he does. Why does he want to take over the world and turn everybody into some giant cursed spirit? What's the whole point? Kenjaku is someone that's obsessed with seeing the upper limits of human potential. He lived in the Heian era, which was called the Golden Age of Jujutsu Sorcery where people basically fought for their lives every single day and constantly became stronger and advanced their techniques. It's possible that through seeing all of this and seeing Sukuna, this sparked Kenjaku's curiosity of what human beings could do when they're pushed beyond what they would normally be. This started a 1000 year journey for Kenjaku of constantly swapping bodies, where he constantly fought to overcome any obstacles in his way. Over the course of this journey, Kenjaku landed in the Meiji period, where he made the death paintings, something that he credits to wanting to see a new form of cursed energy from a fusion of human beings and cursed spirits, although this failed as none of the death paintings met his initial expectations. This eventually led Kenjaku to present day, where he would plan on sealing Satoru Gojo, the user of the Six Eyes. The Six Eyes are connected to Tengen by fate, who can be merged with the entire planet under the right circumstances, an event that would let Kenjaku create the kind of chaos and potential that he wants to see with his own eyes, making it so that Kenjaku would have to get stronger over time to see any of his ambitions come true. Kenjaku has many abilities that he can make use of, one of the most noteworthy being how he got to the modern era in the first place, his body hopping technique. Out of the many techniques that Kenjaku has, this is thought to be his original that he was born with, the one that was naturally attached to his body, with all of his other techniques being those that he gained over the years, but that is speculation because none of it's been confirmed. This doesn't really have any use in combat, but it does work for extending Kenjaku's life. When he finds a body that's suitable for him to take over, he rips the brain out of their body and replaces it with his own. When this happens, the curse technique that the original body has should disappear, but Kenjaku has ways around that. This is how Kenjaku took over the body of Suguru Geto, giving him access to curse spirit manipulation. Noritoshi Kamo, the body that he used to create the death paintings, and many, many other bodies over the years, extending his knowledge and giving him experience over 1,000 years of war and conflict. 
The curse technique that most people may be familiar with when it comes to Kenjaku in combat is curse spirit manipulation, the technique of Suguru Geto that Kenjaku gained access to when he took over Suguru's body. Curse spirit manipulation is one of the most coveted techniques in the series, as it lets the user absorb any curses that they either weaken, heavily outrank in strength, or kill the owners of in combat. This gives Kenjaku access to many moves throughout the series, many of which haven't even been fully explored. Some of these include his curses that he can use to force Yuji to start falling midway to reaching him, a separate curse that lets him interfere with concepts and remove obstacles from his path, rewinding someone's brain back in time by 150 years to the point where they don't even know what year it is or who's in front of them, and another curse that can control the space between a dream and reality, letting him literally be able to go inside of someone's dreams to interact with them while they're sleeping. Kenjaku can also condense the cursed energy of curses that he has at his disposal and fire the energy at his opponents using a maximum technique, Uzumaki. In the hands of Suguru, who had over 4,000 cursed spirits in his possession, this was enough to force Yuta Kotsu into a binding vow that trades his life in exchange for passing the limit of cursed energy output, while being strong enough to rip through special grade Yuki Sakumo when it's condensed to be even smaller than it normally would be. Using this, he's even able to extract curse techniques from curses that he absorbs for a one-time use, which gets rid of the cursed spirit but lets him use their ability in any way that he chooses for a single time. Kenjaku's third technique is anti-gravity that he got when he took over Kaiori Itadori and engraved the technique into his brain. Anti-gravity basically lets Kenjaku control gravity in a 2-3 meter range around himself, with a cooldown period of 6 seconds. He can send his opponents crashing to the ground and even undo gravitational effects from other people's abilities. Using this technique, he can have a great deal of control over his opponent's movements, and even stop himself from being killed by certain abilities. Kenjaku is generally thought of as one of the strongest characters in the series, who may even have a fourth technique that is yet to be seen. An interesting detail about Kenjaku is that when asked why he didn't take over the body of Gojo or Toji, the author replies that Gojo is impossible. To put it simply, you can't kill him. Toji wouldn't be impossible to take over, but there's a risk of Toji's heavenly restriction and Kenjaku's curse technique clashing when he takes over the body, causing some kind of malfunction. Meaning that if Kenjaku took over Toji, then he may have been overwritten by Toji's heavenly restriction, basically giving Toji a second chance at life for free. Hopefully that puts a lot of questions about Kenjaku to rest. There have been a lot of complaints about the fight between Kenjaku and Yuki that popped up in different places. This should give a bit of context to that and some more info on what Kenjaku can do that people tend to overlook. If you want to hear more about Kenjaku, then watch the video on your screen to see how he got as far as he did in the series.